was expensive um, for making shoes. Shoes is a, are a, a high labor content business, um, and so it suits uh, countries with lower labor costs. And so a lot of it at that time went to the Far East, um, a lot of the production of shoes. Um, and gradually the business went down. And I think the seminal point for me in that career was I went to Taiwan, which was then making fashion shoes. And I went to a factory, it was about a five hours drive from Taipei, the capital. And I saw them making shoes, and they were making it very simply, easily. The, the cost of the shoes coming out of the factory were half the price of our production in the UK, in London. So I came back and sold, I had a partner, I sold the business to my partner, and decided to finish manufacturing. Um, and then I had an opportunity of getting out of the shoe business, and I thought, well, it's what I knew. And so I started importing shoes. Um, supplying people like Next and Marks and Spencers and Debenham, some of the big retailers. And I spent most of my time flying backwards and forwards to the Far East, uh, inspecting goods, developing ranges, and selling them to the big retailers um, and mail order companies at that stage in the UK. And I did that for quite some time. It was kind of branding enterprises. We were bringing in about 10 million pairs of shoes. Um, it was very much a business that was uh, entrepreneurial in the sense that you really had to run it. We built up a team. The problem was that um, it was quite easy for other people to set up. The, there were very few barriers to entry in this business. And so a lot of uh, people left and then set up on their own. And in 1992, I thought, you know, I've been importing for a long time. I've been traveling backwards and forwards to the Far East. Uh, production went from Thai 1. Then it went to uh, Vietnam because there were restrictions, there were quotas on Chinese goods into Europe, and then it went back into China. Um, and we opened up an office in Hong Kong. Um, but eventually I thought, this is a difficult business. Because all you're doing basically is buying, you're putting a lot of work into it, you're buying it at X and selling it at X plus 10, 20%, whatever you can get. And gradually I noticed the margins were being squeezed. Because more and more people with increased sort of ease of travel were going out directly to factories in China. And so they were squeezing out uh, the middlemen and the margins were getting tighter and tighter. And my view at that stage was that the only way really to make good money in this business is by establishing a brand. And the easy way, easiest way I thought of establishing a brand was a retail brand. So in 1992, um, I set up June. Uh, we opened our first store on the King's Road in Chelsea, in London. And that was really our first retail operation. And we were running it alongside the wholesale business, the import business. So there were two businesses together. And so that was, uh, that was really the birth of June. So I was a manufacturer, an importer, and finally uh, a retailer. And I would just like to show you, just to give you a feel for June, um, just play a short video on, uh, on June. Um, we're offering a range to both men and ladies, and we're doing accessories. Um, we rebranded re re recently from June to June London because uh, London has a certain cachet and it appeals to lots of international markets. Um, and we've also, as, I, as we said in the, in the video, we've changed the concept of the store. Um, so let's just go through and give you a few facts on June. Um, I mean, what, I, what I'll do is just give you a little bit of background about June, not too long, and then go on to the key points, which is how do we enter new markets? What are the processes that we go through um, and the investigations and the actions that we take to get into new markets? So. That's me. Um, so we are based in London. We've got a turnover of about 200 million. So we're sort of like a medium-sized uh, retailer. We employ 2,000 people. We've got 2,268 uh, stores. Uh, the main brands that we have are June London, which is the main brand. And then we layer on the top with a brand called June Black. 
and we layer on the bottom with a brand called Head of the Hills by Duke. So depending on the distribution channel, if it's in a more affluent area like Selfridge, Selfridges, we put more June Black. If it's in Debenhams in Grimsby, then we'll tend to put more Head of the Hills. So depending on the location, uh, depending on the mix. And then we have another brand called Bertie, um, which we've had uh, for some time, and that's now predominantly a, a men's brand, doing men's more casual, slightly edgier footwear. So those are the four main brands that we, we offer. Our distribution is done through our own stores, um, through department stores, as we mentioned, and there's quite a variety of different locations, um, and then also through wholesale. So quite a number of distri different distribution channels. Um, and as we go through the presentation, you'll see that that really depends on the country and what is the most appropriate way of distributing our product in, in that country. Um, web sales, as we said, are hugely important. They're a growing part of the business. And online now accounts for 25%, which is a huge uh, amount of our sales. So this was our first store in 1992. Uh, it was exclusively ladies. Um, we specialized in occasion wear shoes. Um, that was a very small store, about sort of five, 600 square feet. Um, in fact, our first concept, as you can see, was slightly unusual. We had them on top of boxes, but um, eventually we, we discovered, or we didn't need to discover, we, 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 it wasn't aspirational enough for the brand. And uh, although it was very practical in terms of usage of space, it's not, and actually quite a few uh, French retailers do have this concept. And that's actually where I got the idea. Because shoe shops are difficult in that about a third of the space is taken up as stock. So, and that's a problem because you're paying very high rents. Uh, and so you want to maximize the space that you're paying for. And that was the idea behind this. A, you could use the space better, and B, you could serve the customer quicker. They didn't disappear for five minutes and come back with the wrong shoes. They were there and you could get them very quickly. But as I say, we changed the concept. We've been through various iterations of that. Now what we've ended up with is um, this. And this is our new store in, on Oxford Street, just um, along the road from Selfridges. Uh, completely different, as you can tell. This is how this, the brand has developed. This has been outstandingly successful as a shop fit for us. Um, I think partly because it's very open, so it's very accessible, so footfall into the store is very high. And that's great, because more people are coming in. There's no barrier to coming in. Uh, there's no real shop door as such. The other thing is that it's much more neutral. Uh, we went through a stage where our shops were very feminine. This is much more unisex. And so we have the right, left-hand side of the store is men's, and the right-hand side is ladies. And so now we are appealing to a, a much broader demographic of customers that men's, ladies, and also, as I mentioned in the video, accessory, uh, handbags are really important. I mean, when you go into most of the brands, the big brands these days, the first thing you come across in their store on Bond Street or wherever uh, are the handbags. So handbags are really a, a very key fashion item right now. So um, just to explain where our stores are, we have, as I said, a total of 268 stores. And there is quite a variety of different destinations, as you can see. Our home base is the UK. And there we had 37 stores. It's actually come down recently because we've closed some of the smaller stores and opened bigger stores in, in, in better locations. Uh, but we have a lot of concessions. So really, we're at the stage where we haven't totally exhausted the UK as a market. But the growth is going to come from other areas other than the UK. There is a limit to how much growth there is in the UK. And so we've gone into different um, locations, a very broad um, cross-section. Quite a lot of stores in the Middle East. So we have three stores, I think, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, actually, six, sorry, six stores in Saudi Arabia, but a lot of other Middle Eastern stores. And that was our first stores that we opened about 12 years ago in the Middle East. But we've also opened in, in other countries, and we're planning to open the next year in Mexico, in Iran, in, um, I think, South Korea, 
and a few other destinations as well. Um, as I'll explain later on, we go into these stores in different ways, um, depending on, on the country and depending on the distribution. So, just moving on then. So that's our, our brand statement. Uh, we want to be, or we are the global leader, leader in affordable luxury fashion footwear and accessories. So, I guess stepping back, we think to ourselves, we've done pretty well. You know, the business has grown. We made a major acquisition in 2009, which trebled our size and put us into a lot of those department stores. And so we, as a management team, we think, what are the opportunities for growth? And really, there are two opportunities for growth, two big opportunities for growth. One is multi-channel. Now, I don't know whether you know what multi-channel is about, but it's it's very much, do you know what multi-channel is? No? Multi-channel. So it wouldn't be like different like channels that you could potentially like enter? So like, like new stores or like new like department stores? Not really. It's, it's more around the customer and the customer's ability to buy through different channels. So now the customer can buy online. They can buy through the store. They can buy over the telephone. They can buy on their mobile, de mobile device. So it's really giving the customer infinite freedom to buy whenever they want, on whatever, through whatever channel they want, and to deliver wherever they want. So we can deliver directly to uh, their home. We can, they can collect it from the store, which is what's called click and collect. They can do reserve and collect, which means that they can not pay for it until they go and collect it. So multi-channel now is really the big change in international retailing. Because it's giving the customer the freedom to buy at any time of the day or night, wherever they want. And what we've introduced into our stores is an iPad, uh, which we call Harry for some reason, not quite sure why. But on that iPad, you can see where the stock is available, you can order it on Harry if we don't have the size. We can show what similar styles we've got. So it gives a huge amount of information. It's very much, if you like, part of this whole multi-channel um, experience. And one of the biggest challenges facing retailers today is that integration, that seamless working between shops, what they call bricks and clicks. If you can get those to work together, then you've got a, a winning formula. And certainly that's something that we've invested a, a lot of money in over the last few years, and has been hugely successful. Whereas the growth of our stores is maybe 5% per annum, the growth online has been 40%. So there is a change, a massive change in shopping habits, so that people are now buying more online. And they're using online for research before they go shopping. So rather than go into a store and they don't have what you want, you can go online, you can see whether they have that pair of boots or that piece of furniture or whatever it is you're looking for. So you can do research online. Or alternatively, you can go browsing around the stores. You don't want to carry back a huge, great parcel full of stuff. You go home and you buy it online. So multi-channel is becoming more and more important. Some people call it multi-channel, some people call it omni-channel. But it's the same concept and it's hugely important and it's really changing the face of retailing. And many other products as well. Um, so that's one opportunity. We're, we're going to continue to invest in multi-channel. The other opportunity is obviously international. And that really brings us to the main part of uh, the talk today because we've pretty much reached saturation in the UK. And so the opportunity for us is to go into international markets. And I guess what I want to tell you now is how we go about that. How do we go about going into international markets? So do is research. You need to research the countries. You need to understand 
and, and this is from a macro point of view. You want to see the big picture about the country. So you want to understand the size of the market. And you've got markets like China and the USA that are massive. And then you've got quite small markets like Estonia, which are obviously a lot, lot smaller. So you need to assess the potential of the market and the size of the market before you go in, because they will need different approaches. China is such a massive country that you could have four or five different partners there, because each, you know, the difference between, and Jume will tell you, the difference between the, the north, both climatically, and the south is, is absolutely huge, not only climatically, but in every other way as well, in terms of language and culture. So, doing some research into the size of the market and understanding what is the appropriate distribution channel is, is very important. The second thing is the demographics. You know, what is the population? How wealthy are they? What is the um, educational standards? What are, what are they looking for in terms of a footwear retailer? Are we appropriate for that market? And that's very important in terms of getting the big picture view. And the last thing is understanding sort of the nature of the market. Where's the market going? Very interesting changes going on. For example, China. China now is becoming, and you must be read about the float of Alibaba, you know, the biggest company, I think, in the world in terms of market capitalization. Incredible. And that is all about online. So now if you want to go into the Chinese market, an easier route of entry is going in through Tmall and a lot of the e-commerce sites rather than opening up your own store because there is the market is now attuned and that is the growth area. Stores, that are, there are almost too many stores and not enough shopping centres. So that could be the right way of going into that market. So understanding the nature of the market is really important. The next thing, obviously, is the geography. How easy is it to get to that market? Most of our goods are made in China. Quite a lot are made in Brazil. Some are made in Europe. So there's a mixture of different sources, depending on the type of product. And so how can we logistically get it into that market is quite an important consideration. Because often there are all sorts of duties and difficulties in terms of transportation which make certain markets more challenging than others. The other big consideration is, is climate. You know, we divide our ranges into warm climate countries, cold climate countries. And there are some countries which, if you like, are contra-seasonal, like South Africa and Australia, because they're the other side of the, the world, so their autumn is our summer, and vice versa. So climate is very important. You know, we don't sell a lot of boots in Saudi Arabia in the winter because it's sort of 30 degrees plus all the year round. So you, it's a very important consideration in terms of getting the range right for those markets. And the same applies to, I should imagine, most of your home countries. You know, it, it really does depend a lot, but most of you mostly don't sell a, a lot of winter product. Um, and the other thing is understanding the regions and the cities. You know, where do you want to go if you're opening up a store? Which, do you want to go in, into the major cities, uh, which usually are more expensive in terms of rental? Do you want to start in, a, in another city, you know, you know, Canterbury, just to test the market? So understanding the regions and cities within a country uh, is also very important. And in particular in terms of the Chinese experience, where it's so vast, and the market is very different. Same in America, you know, the market's very different in California and Florida than it is in, in um, Maine or, or New York. So once you've looked at the geographical, then obviously cultural issues may play a huge part in terms of um, the market. So fashion is important. We're a fashion brand. Is this a fashionable market? Do they buy fashion shoes? Um, some markets are more fashionable than others. Turkey, for example, is a very fashionable market, very colourful. You know, they like colour there. Other markets, 
are different. They, they just really want black or brown. So it's very different. So understanding the market influences and the fashionability of the market is very important. I mentioned religious influences. Because, for example, in someone like Saudi Arabia, where they go to prayer quite a lot, they want shoes which you can take on and off quite easily. So we sell a lot of sandals there, which you, can, you don't have to lace up. Lace-ups are much more difficult. So you need to think about all those factors that will affect um, the customer going to buy the shoes. Lifestyle is important as well. You know, what is the lifestyle? Is, there a, is, is it a cultural city? Do they like clubbing? You know, if you go to Liverpool or Glasgow in the UK, there's a big clubbing scene. So in the evening, all the girls get dressed up and wear high heels and go clubbing. Is there that market there? It depends. Some there is, some there isn't. And in fact, certain places, for example, um, in some cities where they've got a lot of, lot of cobbled stones, practically it's very difficult to walk around in high heels. So there you'll have a lot more flat shoes. So the market, uh, the local, the lifestyle is very important, as well as local taste and sizing. Sizing can be very important. You know, we have a store now which we opened last September in New York on Broadway in Soho. And we have a lot of Chinese customers, and they keep on asking us for size 35. Now, we don't have 35, we start at 36. So we've had to change the size range to suit that particular customer profile. Uh, and so we now have a lot more, or will have from next season, a lot more 35s. The same in uh, Galerie Lafayette in Paris. A lot of Chinese tourists, we need a lot more uh, 35s. And actually, with the general growth in Chinese tourism, uh, we've had to adjust um, the, our proposition and often have Mandarin-speaking staff to meet that demand. In so, in France? Uh, in France, the Mandarin speaking. yes. I mean, if you go into Galerie Lafayette, they have uh, announcements in French, English, and Mandarin because they have a huge, they have busloads of Chinese coming to the store um, and they allow them you know, an hour and a half, two hours to go around and a lot of the announcements are made in Mandarin and a lot of those customers don't speak English or French and so you need to have a, a local speaker to explain about the shoes and if you have that, you've got a competitive advantage. Um, and then legal restrictions are also important. Certain countries such as India has historically limited you to a, the percentage of the company you can own. You can't own more than 50%. So you need to be aware of all of the legal factors that are going to affect your trading in that particular uh, territory. Another fact that's very important is protecting your intellectual property. If you've got a brand, you need to register it, register it very quickly. In China, a lot of um, is unscrupulous individuals are registering brands so that when you go to register your brand, you can't, it's already registered. And they end up charging a lot of money, you end up overpaying considerably to get that brand back. So registering the intellectual property is absolutely crucial. And this is true of any industry, you know, you need to make sure that the market you go into we have a problem, for example, in India. In India, where we have, I think it's four or five stores, um, we want to roll out Head of the Heels as a brand because it's a lower price brand and therefore it's got wider reach. The problem is that brand is already, already registered. So we're having to change the name of that brand for that particular market. So registering the, um, protecting your intellectual property, your trademarks, is, is really important. Um, you need to be aware of the taxation implications, the capital flows, can you take money out of the country, are there restrictions there? Um, and you also need to be aware of employment law. It's very different. We're opening a store in the new World Trade Center in New York um, in the autumn. And we've been horrified by the cost because you need to have union labor. I mean, you don't in every location, but this particular location, it's union, unionized. And that's put the cost of the shop fit up by 20%. So 
you need to be aware of these factors. Germany, for example, there are very um, strict social requirements in terms of payments to German employees. And again, that pushes it up. So the cost of doing business in those countries is, is higher. And you need to be aware of them, obviously, um, as part of your homework in analyzing the market. <coughs> And then, of course, you need to find the right stores, and that's um, really crucial. You know, what is it they say about retail? There are three important things, location, location, location. And if you don't get the location right, you can have the best offer in the world with the nicest shoes and the best staff, and the, you know, but no one's going to go there because it's just not the right location. So the research you do, and often here you need to have professional advice, the research you do to find the right location is, is incredibly important. Um, and you need to decide whether they're shopping malls or high streets. In the Middle East it's mainly shopping malls because they're much, you know, temperature-wise, climatically, it's much more pleasant shopping in an air-conditioning shopping centre than it is on a high street. So most of the Middle Eastern shops are in shopping centres. And the same goes for a lot of other um, locations as well. Um, and then you need to assess what is the demand for stores. You know, how easy is it to get the store that you want? Often that, you know, it took us three years to find the store in Broadway in New York. And I was going over there looking, and there were all sorts of factors. There wasn't the right store, but it was better to wait for the right location rather than to rush in and get something that would prove to be disappointing, especially for your first stores. Poland's a good example. We went into Poland. We went into Krakow and some other town whose name I've forgotten. And there were bad locations. And the partner that we were working with, the franchise partner, wanted us to go in there. Surprise, surprise, they didn't work. They were very unsuccessful. And we withdrew from that market. So Poland's not on that list. And the reason was we were naive. We didn't insist that we want our first store to be in the capital of Warsaw and we want it to be a prominent store um, which really showcases the brand. So real estate and location is, is very, very important. And finally, well, I think it's finally on this section, on the research, commercial. I and mean, this is the key. The whole commercial thing is absolutely crucial. You know, why is there a demand? Is there a demand for a June store? What is the competitive advantage that you have here? The competition is crucial. Who's shopping there? You know, who are the big retailers? In our space, the two international retailers that are major competitors, is one is called Aldo, and they are a Canadian-based company, uh, and the other is Nine West, who are a US company. And both Nine, Nine West and Aldo, if you like, set the tone, and that's really important. Pricing is really important as well, because different markets have different price structures. Footwear is a product where the demand is very elastic to price. So if you push the price down, your sales go up very much. Not on all products, but a lot of the key core products they do. So getting your pricing right for these markets is absolutely crucial. And that is something that we, I'm not even sure whether we spend enough time on, but really looking at who's in that market, what are their prices, and making sure that they are competitive is very, very important. Um, you know, with the economy as it is at the moment, all around the world, people have less disposable income. And therefore it's crucial that you have the right price for that product. Now, our product is a little bit more expensive, but we feel obviously there's added value and it's worth that extra um, price, but we can't be too much higher. Yeah? I was going to ask you regarding an album, so sort of the brand position itself like, as a little higher than album. Yes. Okay, so more expensive, better quality. Definitely, a nicer environment. Um, yes. Album is. Aldo is very popular in New York, yes. Um, they've got a lot of stores in the States and they've been hugely successful. Um, and I guess in a way, 
you know, that's one of the, I mean, I don't know how many stores they have, but they have a hell of a lot of international. They oh, go for a thousand. Yeah, you know, if you go down Fifth Avenue in New York, every block there'll be an Aldo. There's a Starbucks and an Aldo. So, um, yeah, it's been huge. Yeah. Is that once you start it, it's difficult to stop. Because once you've given someone a discount, they won't buy full price. And Debenhams is a good example. Debenhams had really bad figures the year before last because they were constantly promoted. They had Blue Cross days and Red Cross days and Yellow Cross days. And in the end, no one was buying full price. They were all waiting for the promotional period. So understanding the nature of the market is really important and preparing for it before you go in. So the big conclusion is, is this a market where you can trade profitably? And you're looking at all those factors to come to that decision. Um, and how do you go about this research? A lot of it you can do through desk research. You can go on the internet. The internet, as you know, is a huge sort of um, source of information. So a lot of it, demographics, understanding, those factors can be done through desk research. In certain cases, we appoint consultants. If we have a lack of resource or if there's a very specialist market or it's a big market, for example, right now, we're considering going into opening stores in Germany we've appointed a firm of consultants to go there to really investigate the market in detail. Because that would be it's such a big commitment for us and the potential is so big in a market like Germany that you really want to do uh, a very thorough piece of work. Uh, and often consultants can do that better. And then finally, pretty obviously, you need to go and visit yourself. You know, if you're going to open a shop in Uganda or in Nigeria or in Japan or in Saudi Arabia, you can't open without going and having a look, or in Thailand, uh, without looking at the market and seeing what is happening there, and getting a feel for that market yourself. So visiting the market is crucial. So just going through this relatively quickly, you've got, in our case, different channels in which you can go into the market. The first one is you can open your own store, and that's what we've done in New York. Very expensive. I mean, you know, the store in New York ended up, because it was an old building, had to redo it, cost $2 million. That's a lot of money. So the thing about opening your own store, it can be very expensive. Um, and certainly a lot more than some of the other rooms. But having said that, you are making a brand statement. You know, you're telling people about the brand. And from that point of view, it's very important. Um, but you also need, obviously, to dedicate some of your team to go and work there and prepare for it and get the stock ready. So it's a much more work involved in, um, in opening your own store. And of course, because of that, it's a greater risk. So the second um, one is, is a concession. Concessions are good because they don't cost you so much. The payback is much quicker, lower risk. The only problem is you don't necessarily control the environment. So if you go into Phoenix in Canterbury, it's like a Phoenix most other places, you can't control that floor. You can't put your own design concept in. You're limited. But having said that, it's hugely, for us, it's, been, it's a major part of our business. In the UK, I think about 45% of our business is our own stores, but 55% are concessions. So concessions are a very good way. And there is a change in shopping habits now that more people are going to department stores. I guess because it's convenience, it's one-stop shopping, it's much easier. So if, if concession means a license, business, or franchise? No, concession is where maybe it's like a shop in shop. Shop in shop. So it's uh, you go into a department store and you pay a commission on each sale that you make, typically around 25%. So we, we own the stock, we provide the staff, whenever we make a sale, it goes through their till and they take 25% and remit 75% to us. So the shops don't have an inventory disc? You have. We have. It's part of our, absolutely, we control the stock, it's delivered from our uh, distribution centre, um, all they do is just take the money and provide the space. And can you stock space? 
They do, and, and that's a really good point, because if you don't have the stock space, it's very difficult. Shoes, sometimes the limiting factor on the level of sales you achieve is the stock space. Because once you've sold out of a size, if you can't replenish it, you, you know, someone may come in and want a 42 and they haven't got it. We do try and get over that by making daily deliveries into the stores, but um, it's not always easy. Is the sales team yours or theirs? The sales team is ours. Depends. John Lewis, the sales team is theirs. House of Fraser, jo um, Debenhams, it's ours. John Lewis, we do actually send people in to help them sometimes, so it, it, it does vary. Um, so that's a concession, and then you've got the website, and um, websites obviously, have, I mentioned before how important they are, uh, but it's a very good way if you're going into a new country to open a website. It's a low cost option, and you can get quite good information uh, from the website without having to open a store. Um, it's very easy, and, and we have local language sites now, so in Germany, in France, in the USA, it's all as if you were living in that country, in the local language, you pay in the local currency, so it makes it quite easy. Um, but the thing about websites, you need to spend money to get people to go to it. You can't just put a website up and people rush there. You, know, they, you need to spend money on the marketing side of it um, to drive traffic. Um, and a lot of that is around now social media and other forms of um, marketing online. Uh, this one actually. That's, that's forward, I think back. One back. That's it. So the next one is a joint venture. This is where you go into part with partnership with someone else. Uh, they look after all of the retail side, they get the stores, they look after the staff, and you look after the stock, the buying, the product, and you give them the concept. And that can work very well. And that's something we're looking at right now in Switzerland. We found a really good partner, knows the market very well. We've tested the market because we've got two concessions, and we're now going to go into it with, um, with uh, a partner. And then lastly, or not lastly, there's franchise partner. And a lot of our business is by franchise. Because we don't want to actually open a store in somewhere like the Middle East. Uh, it's very difficult, it's very specialised. So there we have a partner. And typically there, we, the partner, signs a franchise agreement. And we provide the stock. And we charge a percentage on top of that stock in order for them to buy the stock. Um, and then sometimes also a royalty on sales as well. And depending on the partner, depending on how involved we get. With some partners, they just come in and buy the range. With others, we actually decide the range for them. And we control their stock. And the tendency is now for you to get more and more involved in how foreign franchises are managed. Because often they don't have the expertise in buying, and in merchandising, you need to make it successful. And lastly, just wholesaling. So it's a simple model of the lot. Someone comes in, you have a distributor, they buy the stock, and they sell it to people in the local market. Uh, and you make a profit on that. And that's, um, that's the easiest one to do. Um, although less people are doing it because they don't want the stock risk. They don't want to buy the stock and hold it on the danger that it doesn't sell. If it doesn't sell, you've got to mark it down. So more and more, the trend is for people to say, look, I don't mind buying the stock, but actually I want you to guarantee the profit. Or if it doesn't sell, I want you to take it back. So there is a shift now in people taking that risk on holding stock. And indeed, in our American business, they have a system called give backs. And there, actually, what you've got to do is at the end of the season, they look at what the profit they've made, and if they haven't made enough profit, they come to you and say, actually, we want more money from you. So, and then choosing a partner, obviously you need to make sure they've got the right credit status, the right references, um, you know, 
we've often got, uh, and it's a learning, you know, partners in Russia. We pulled out of Russia because the partner there uh, didn't pay his bills recently. Obviously, we must have read about it, a lot of problems in Russia, uh, the oil price going down, uh, embargoes, guy ran out of money, didn't pay, and so you know, we've ended up uh, with one store there, fortunately only one store, which is going to close down because the partner's just not um, managed to, to, um, to pay his bills. So um, credit status and doing your due diligence in terms of that is, is really important. You're looking for a partner who's obviously got retail experience, you need to visit their stores, you need to talk to them because it's no good going with a partner who doesn't have retail experience if you're in the retail business. Just like if you're in pharmaceuticals, there's no point going with someone who's not an expert in that field. So you need an expert in that field. You need to go around the market, look at their stores and make sure that the standards are standards that you would expect in your own stores. Uh, and they also must obviously must know the market very well. They need to know about fashion as well. We are a fashion brand. So if they, let's say there are other franchise arrangements with discounters who are very low price, usually they're not the right partner for us. And also, very importantly, they need to have access to retail. They need to know the main landlords so that they can get the best shops in the best locations. If they can't, it's a big disadvantage. As I mentioned before, if you don't have really good locations, it's very difficult to be a successful retailer. And lastly, do they have the right team? They need someone dedicated to this business. There's no point having a part-time person. You, know, you need someone who's a dedicated brand manager for your brand, who's going to look after that brand, really nurture it, really fight for it, and make it successful in that market. And lastly, you need to get on with them. You know, like in business, like in life, you need to find that you, you get on with the partner. There needs to be some empathy uh, between you. And they need to have good operational standards as well. Because um, you know, retail is detail, and unless the stores look really nice, um, they're not going to be the right partner. So once you've got the partner, you've obviously got to prepare a business plan. Have you all prepared business plans? Yeah? No? Well, business plan pretty much is just saying, you know, how many stores am I going to open? Where am I going to open them? What profit am I going to make? So doing the business plan is, is a really important element of what needs to be done. Um, and you need to do a, a marketing plan as well. Good? And so really the plan needs to be, you, know, you need to put down in writing, it's really important that you really put pen to paper and you've got a very clear view of exactly what you're aiming to do. You know, what are you hoping to achieve? A clear action plan for opening in a new market is absolutely essential. And doing budgets about <coughs> what you hope to make. As I mentioned before, you need to adapt your range for specific markets. So the product needs to be looked at. What we tend to say is that 70% of the range must be our core range. The other 30% can be especially for that market. So you need to have uh, an understanding of what it is they like and what they don't like in that market. It hasn't got big results because you need to uh, you need to understand about the new challenges as well as obviously looking over your looking at your home market. It's very easy to take your eye off the ball on the home market. Just briefly on marketing, I mean once you get into the market, then you need to market. You need to get the brand across. No one knows the brand, they know the brand in your home market, they don't know the brand in this foreign market, so you need to get across your brand. And how do you do that? I mean, if you're a big brand like Prada or Gucci, you can spend a fortune on print advertising, so you have very glossy adverts in Vogue, um, or on television, or at airports. Um, but it tends to be a very expensive route for many, uh, many companies. Opening stores, obviously, someone like Zara, they don't advertise, but they have very big stores in prominent locations, and that is their way of advertising, because they look really great, 
And so when you go to a market, you see a Zara, you, you can very clearly understand what that brand is all around, about. So they just go for that. And then there's public relations. We have public relations in-house, and that way you get, first of all, you attract celebrities. So you try and get celebrities on board to support your brand. So if they're seen wearing your shoes, it makes a big difference. You know, if Beyonce was walking down the catwalk wearing June shoes, it'd be really good for us. You know, and be, obviously you get a lot of hits on your website, and um, sales will go up tremendously. So getting celebrity support, getting coverage in magazines and newspapers, editorial, is also very important. Social media is becoming more and more important. In New York, it's all around blogging. Bloggers, really, we had a blogger called Eva Chen. She's evidently one of the biggest bloggers in New York. She has something like three million followers. She wore our shoes and she liked them and she, she sort of did a hashtag on, on June shoes. And our sales went up on a particular product that she was wearing, 3,000% because she was wearing those shoes. So the power now of social media and blogging is huge. And getting into that space, understanding who are the key leaders there is, is very, very important. And then lastly, on the website, there's things called PPC, it's pay-per-click, you pay Google to have when you go for a search, you're near the top of the search, uh, you can pay for that, and that's obviously a way of, you know, you, under shoe shops, you put in shoe shops, June comes up first, great offer, 20% off, you'll go and shop in June. So you can pay for that, it's called pay-per-click. Pay the other one is SEO, which is search engine optimization. So it's the use of words that you have on your website that will attract the consumer. Attract, not the consumer, but the analytics. So if you say red boot, and that is picked up because people see red boot, they'll go, they'll be, it will be raised on the listing within Google and you'll have more visitors to your site. So you've done it all. You've done your research. Been a long exercise been to the market, you've looked at um, potential partners, you've found a partner, you've opened the stores, you've adapted your range for stores, you've marketed, it's all there. Then it's very easy to forget about it and you get on with your day job, but that's what you mustn't do. You've got to visit the market very regularly. <coughs> and to understand how you need to change the proposition. The chances of you getting it right the first time is very small. You need to change, you will need to change certain aspects. So reviewing what you're doing is very important. Very important to listen to the local managers, giving them autonomy. Otherwise they can feel very distant and they're sending emails to you and no one's really reading them enough and they're not taking action. So you need to give autonomy to your local team. And lastly, you need to visit very frequently. Because unless you visit, you won't know what's going on. There's no substitute for actually visiting the stores, talking to your partners out there, and seeing how things are progressing. So finally, at last, we've got there. There are do's. You've got to do your research. You've got to do it from a position of strength. You need to be strong in your home market before you go international. You need to make sure you've got the right resource. You've got a team of people that will be dedicated to making this happen. Because in life it's very difficult to think it's going to happen, but it won't. Unless you've got people that are clear on what they need to do, it won't get done. You need to understand local tastes. Really important. Tastes are different all around the world. There is a global fashion, more and more, but to be really successful, you need to understand the nuances of different countries and how, what they like. You need to take it cautiously to start with because it's very easy to lose a lot of money. And the history of people being successfully international is not that wide. A lot of retailers go abroad, try it, though it doesn't work, and they come back to their home market. So you need to take it cautiously and learn. And you need to find the right channel. Don't expect it to be like your home market. It will be different. 
and don't expect it to be easy because it certainly won't be. So that's about it. That's um, everything I've got.